Not too short. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my next episode of my podcast. I hope you are all doing well. I want to start by thanking all my listeners. I mean, we have increased the number of countries that have downloaded If Comedians Rule the World with President Abonjo. We now have 22 countries. And out of 22 countries, I can definitely tell you we have six countries ruled by dictators. And North Korea has just recently joined us. I didn't know I had a fan in North Korea. So this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Look, I'm not going to waste your time. I have a very special guest. I say a special guest because uh, once again, there are lots of people who supported me last year during the attempted coup by BBC Studios and E4. And there's this man I, I so much admire because I've been watching him and you know, I've never ever met him on stage. We've never ever met and performed no, live different. together. But I saw what he wrote about um, uh, the BBC and E4 Studios thing. And that was very, very supportive. And then uh, I think someone also got, something got nicked last year. And um, he mentioned it again and said, you know, President Obonjo, and I, like I said to you guys, President Obonjo is now like a story. <laughs> Every time someone gets something nicked within the UK comedy industry, I am a reference. So I, I have made it. I, I have made it. As far as I'm <laughs> I want to start. A right? word for plagiarism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to start by introducing you to someone I really respect, and I really I, I am honoured to have him here. His name is Mitch Ben. He's the country's leading musical satirist. That's what the Times say. And uh, Mitch Ben is a yeah. comedian, author, songwriter, musician, actor and is widely acknowledged as one of the best writers and performers of comedy songs in the United Kingdom. He's perhaps best known as the resident comic songwriter on BBC Radio 4's The Now Show from 1999 to 2016. Mitch has a large online following and I'm one of his followers and his recent comedy songs, such as, you will hear me swear now, fuck all, I'm moving to Scotland. <laughs> have amassed more than a million views. Mitch began his comedy career in Edinburgh in the mid nineties before moving to London and becoming one of the most in-demand comedians in the UK comedy circuit. He has released, listen to this, he has released many albums of comedy songs and has performed all over the world, including South Africa, Singapore, China, and many European nations, but he has never ever visited Laughter Republic. We've got to no. do something about it. You need to come and perform in Laughter Republic. In addition to his work, the new show, Mitch has presented several series of his own show on BBC Radio and TV credits, Life at Junglers ITV, Watchdog BBC, and the Comedy St Store. Not only is he a comedian, not only is he a musician, he's also an actor. Mitch acting credits include Merlin BBC One, and in 2013, he took over the role of Zappard Be Bebo Brooks for the live stage That's tour it. of the Hitch Hikers. So my people, my comedy intelligence have really done very well because they have researched Mitch and they have got the right information. And finally, Mitch is a weekly columnist for the new European newspaper and has written three science fiction novels, Terra, Terra's World, and Terra's War. And I have to say that I am very pleased my director of communications because Mick, Mitch rather, is in the Guardian. And so this is a coup for us. We have one of the most <laughs> high profile comedians in the UK coming to talk to a dictator. So Mitch, how are you? I'm okay. Yes, my profile is unusually high in the last 36 hours or so, uh, because there was a bit about me in the Guardian yesterday. And, and my attempts to get my book writing career back online after it stalled quite badly a few years ago. And, uh, but it's up and running again now. And, and the, the trilogy is very nearly complete. I've written uh, a trilogy of sci-fi novels, Terror, Terror's World and Terror's War, which finally comes out in March after a ridiculously long delay. That's a very long, boring story. But you're right. I've never played the laughter of the Republic, Your Excellency. In the moment, you're rightfully restored to the power. You shall have to get me back over. Yeah, yeah, we will. We will. We'll talk. We'll talk. We'll, talk. we'll be good to have you uh, with us. Um, first question. How have you been coping with the uh, strange times that we're in? I, I, I see yeah. that Boris Johnson has uh, traveled to Scotland. He should be arrested for traveling, from breaking the rules. 
I'm kind of surprised he got out of Scotland alive, uh, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, these are um, very, very difficult times for the comedy industry. Uh, I'm, I'm actually doing okay. I'm, I'm almost slightly embarrassed by this because I, you know, a, a lot of very, very close friends of mine are, are struggling quite badly. Um, I, I'm actually doing okay, partly because I was doing a lot of other stuff already. And I was also doing quite a lot of stuff online already. And that is really the only stuff that's still happening. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uh, online gigs these days. I'm running a, a monthly online show for my Patreon supporters myself. But also, I had my Patreon thing up and running for about three years before the lockdown started. So I had a quite an established little following on Patreon enough to you know, make that into a proper income stream. As you point out, I write a newspaper column. So I had a few other things on the go which have still been on the go for the past year or so. So, I mean, and, and that, I hasten to add, is not down to any kind of skill or judgment on my part. It's pure luck. Um, it's pure good fortune. And I'm very aware of this. I'm also aware that um, a lot of friends of mine have, have struggled quite badly. Um, but it's weird because the, 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 in many respects, the, the people who found it the hardest to deal with a lot of that are, are, are the people I've often sort of admired for their sheer ability to focus on that one thing, which is something I've never had. I've always been an appalling gadfly. I've always had to have like five or six almost entirely unrelated things on the go at once. Um, I've, of, I've often thought I might have been able to make a better go at anything if I'd actually been able to concentrate on it. <laughs> but as it is, I kind of, I flit from one thing to the other, like the sort of, I don't know, dilettante that I guess I am. But like I say, oddly enough, that's kept me afloat in the last year or so. so. You never can tell. Yeah, I, I have similar friends who are really, really struggling. Um, mm. But and I know you said um, it's not about judgment, but clearly that's almost like a, a visionary, someone who didn't put his eggs in one basket and just decided I've got to multitask, you know, almost like, you know, put your eggs in, rather put your eggs in one basket, have different skills. So that yeah. when, yeah, because that's, that is just, what, what, I, advice I think, would you, what advice would you give to comedians in particular who are struggling uh, right now? <laughs> struggling right now, I don't know. Uh, just uh, keep at it and find uh, and find something to keep. Yeah, find something to do. Find something to keep yourself busy. Find ways of, um, you know. I mean, the thing is, there, there there are tools available to us which simply wouldn't have been mm -hmm. as recently as 10, 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. There is now YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. I mean, I was going to say it's difficult to build up a following on YouTube, but actually we know that's not the case. There are comedy stars generally of the generations younger than myself who mm -hmm. have built an entire following on mm -hmm. YouTube. And by the time they actually come to play any live gigs, it's like the Shepherd Bush Empire. Yeah. You know, um, so it is possible. I guess even for those of us who've gotten very used to performing live, it is possible to you know, parlay that over into, into online stuff. And what the specifics of that would be would be unique to each act in question. So I, I wouldn't give any specific advice, but I'm sure that most comedians could find some kind of online iteration of what they do. And then I guess it's just a question of how you attract attention to it. How do you, how do you get attention to it? Um, and I will offer my services in that regard. You know, I've got quite a deep, and Twitter following. I've got quite a decent Facebook following. So if any of my comedy pals out there have got an online project and that they want to, you know, try and get some more eyeballs on, if there's anything I can do to big it up, then do give us a shout because I'll be very, very happy to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, let, let's start because you 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 have several um, things you have you, you you focus on. You've got your music, you've got your acting, mm -hmm. you've got the comedy. I see the number of guitars that you have behind you. I am yeah, I yeah. am jealous. So this, I, I am jealous. I, normally, I would say to my guests that you you don't have a poster of me behind you, but how many, how many guitars do you have there, sir? Oh, this is a very, very, very small sample of my guitars. Um, wow. I, I've, I've got a stack of them on a shelf over there. Um, some of them are scattered on other properties. I think there's a few in my mom's house in Liverpool. I actually don't know how many guitars I've got. I, I point out that... I, that, that um, I only ever buy guitars that actually form a specific, perform a specific purpose. Um, you know, I don't, I don't just buy them because I see them on eBay and I think they look hot. I, 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 I time buy guitars that actually fill a gap in the arsenal, even if it's um, like a, a, a rather curious gap. I'll just bring this one at the shot over here. This is a guitar I bought quite recently. I bought this one about two and a half years ago. I bought this one um, when I was doing a show in Edinburgh called Doing It On Purpose in 2018. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and the opening number was a kind of an Eddie Cochran thing. And the closing number was a kind of a Roy Orbison-ish thing. And I remember thinking, I would really like to have a 50s looking guitar to play these songs on. And I like this one because it's got F holes. It's got these things on the big round sound hole. Uh, so I bought this purely because it had F holes. Um, <laughs> and, and it visually suited something I was trying to do. There's a guitar over there. I'll just see that one over there, these sort of hummingbird mm -hmm. acoustic. That's, yeah. that's my Beatles guitar. So wow. I, did a, I, did a show about, I did a show about the Beatles in 2013 called Mitch Ben is the, the 37th Beatle, because I'm a bit of a Beatles obsessive. And I also have all kinds of weird little personal connections to the Beatles, largely through my parents kind of knowing them when they were, you know, before I was born in, in Liverpool in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wanted, when I was putting this show together, I, I realized I didn't have a remotely Beatly looking guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I put the, and then, yeah, I was at Glastonbury that year. And Elvis Costello came out playing a Gibson J160, which is a guitar which is specifically associated with John Lennon. It's mm -hmm. just basically a Gibson Hummingbird with a single coil pickup and two really conspicuous volume and tone knobs stuck mm -hmm. to the outside where you wouldn't get knobs on an acoustic guitar. And I suddenly thought, wow, if I could get over a J160 or J160 copy, that would really tie the show together visually. And um, I tried Epiphone, which is the official budget version, found one in a shop and it was terrible. Um, so I thought, I wonder if anybody just does a copy of it. I wonder if it's just, just a plain knockoff of it. And that one is by a company called Vintage, uh, actually a subset of a company called John Hornby Skews. And I found that there were two shops in the country that would actually sell it over the counter because I wanted to try it before I played it. And one of them was this big guitar warehouse in Blackburn. And I, uh, I had a, a show on in Manchester, the preview of the show in Manchester. I thought, what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave the house like two hours early overshoot Manchester, go to this guitar store in Blackburn, see if that guitar's any good. And it was brilliant. It was way better than the Epiphone. It's really good value for money. I only paid a couple hundred quid for it. But it, it, and, uh, but it, just, it just tied the Beatles show together visually, having a Beatles guitar to play in the songs. And also, there's just something quite nice about buying a copy of John Lennon's guitar in Blackburn, Lancashire. As I mentioned in the song, you know, never look for the 4,000 holes while I was up there. But, you know. Um, but yeah, so that, that, that's... I, I do have stupid numbers of guitars but i do use all of them at some point do you have a favorite one would you say that one is your favorite oh, just at the moment my favorite is me telecaster okay my blonde, tele, my, my, my blonde sort of um bruce springsteen telecaster i've only had that for a few months but what that came down to is about i've got this guitar uh which is uh it's called a variax line a line six variax and it's a digital guitar and i play it with the band because you can electronic it it, it, it basically it's got like a, almost like a little sampling computer inside it and it can sound like every guitar ever made from mm -hmm. like all the classic uh, electric models um all your fenders all your gibsons all your classic acoustic models um and you just basically flick switches on it and it digitally reproduces the sound of these guitars and i was using it for recording and it was getting a bit worn out it was getting a bit battered and i thought i want to just use that for gigging and it suddenly occurred to me that when i was recording an electric guitar sound at home Literally, I think about nine times out of ten, I would start to think the sound like a Telecaster because I just really like that really bright, toppy, almost harsh Telecaster sound. And then I thought, why do I not own a Telecaster? That's obviously the sound I like best. So I, I bought that one just a few months ago. And uh, that, if anything, is my favorite guitar at the moment, is my Tele. Um, wow. But I, I've had lots of favorite guitars. I, I, I do, I, I do, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of about guitars the way guys are meant to be about cars. I'm, I'm very kind of unromantic about cars, partly because I didn't learn to drive until I was 30. <laughs> um, but, you know, if I'd learned to drive when I was 17, then yeah, I might have a bit more of a sort of romantic attachment to them. But I regard cars basically as utensils, you know, they either do the job or they don't. Um, whereas guitars, I've got a much more kind of, personal and sort of romantic attachment to. I think they're mm. beautiful objects above and beyond what you can do with them. Mm. Some of them well, are anyway. Okay, so, and, and you specialize in rock music. So what, which came first? Was it the rock music or was it the comedy or was it both? Oh, it's so hard to, it's so hard to delineate because I was doing various different things that ultimately evolved into what I do. Uh, I had I was in bands at university and I put bands together. You know, I, I used to jam with mates of mine back in Liverpool when I was a teenager. And then I went to Edinburgh University and put my first proper band together while I was there. But around the same time, I was also one of the founder members of a thing called the Improverts, which is the Edinburgh University improv show, which is still going. 
30 years after me and a bunch of mates set it up. Wow. And rather adorably, I was in Edinburgh a couple of years ago and one of them flyered me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at I'm looking at this bit of my going, I was in this before you were born. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was already, I've, you know, I was always doing theatre stuff. I was briefly in the Everyman Youth Theatre back in Liverpool when I was a kid. Uh, I uh, around the same time, and apparently Daniel Craig was as well, but I don't remember him. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so, anyway, um, and, and then you know, I did a lot of a lot of theatre at uh, university, a lot of improv, and I first ever did stand up in 1991 in Montreal. Not the festival, just Montreal. Okay. Uh, long, boring story why I was in Montreal in the summer of 1991. And then I kind of forgot all about it for three years and got back in it, in, to it in Edinburgh in 94. And uh, after I've been doing it for about two years, at the time, there wasn't really much of a year-round scene in Scotland. There is now. There's a much healthier, bigger comedy scene in Scotland now mm -hmm. than there was back in the mid-90s. So after about two years of it, I realised that if I was going to take it seriously, I was going to have to come down to London. So I come down to London in 96. So it was it was an evolution. I mean, I've, I've sometimes heard myself described as a frustrated rock star. And I only take issue with that in that that suggests that at some point I put some effort into being a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I didn't, you know. Uh, and I'm not a frustrated rock musician because I have great fun being a rock musician. I just put it to rather unorthodox ends. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I've still got my band, Mitch Ben and the Distractions. I haven't toured with them for a few years because that got pro prohibitively expensive. But we still, when the world is there, which it's not at the moment, we still have a monthly club night in London called the Distraction Club, mm -hmm. which I present with the band, which I very much look forward to and very much looking forward to bringing back as soon as it's safe to have shows on in unventilated basements again. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so that's about the music. Um, <laughs> what, and it's rock, and it's, what's, what, for me, I, 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 before I gave up running the country, I, I, <laughs> I, I started performing comedy after arriving in the UK on the state visit, and I went to the comedy store. I won't bore you with the details, but as I, got to know people within the comedy circuit, I always got the impression that, um, I don't know whether you see yourself as a musical comedian, but- Oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, 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 yeah. there's I'm, always this view that um, if you're a musical comedian or a character comedian, you're hiding behind your guitar, you're hiding behind your uniform. How, is that something that ha was around during your time? And what are your- Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I figured this out a few years ago as to why you don't get a lot of respect on the circuit as a musical act. And I suspect possibly also as anything other than a white guy in a shirt. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of default stand up, what I call, you know, your white guy in a mm -hmm. shirt. Um, but particularly, I think it applies to musical comics. And I think it's because of this. It is possible. I will absolutely own it is possible to play a blinder as a thoroughly mediocre musical comedian. Mm -hmm. You can still bring the house down as a truly average musical comedian if you rock up with a guitar when they're all drunk enough for a sing-song and get a bunch of rude words to run to the tune of Wild Thing. You know, you, you, you can, you can play, have an absolute stormer with that. Um, the flip side of that is that if you try and do something a bit cleverer with musical comedy, like I like to think I do, I like to think there's a bit more to what I do than just the pissed up sing song kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You don't always get credit for it because, well, it's easy for him because he's a musical act. Do you see what I mean? And um, you think, well, it could be easy for me if I was getting a bunch of rude words to the drive the tune of one thing. That's not what I'm doing. Now, I think I think I'm old and gray enough now for the people whose opinions I actually care about <laughs> to have got the hang of the fact that there is a bit more to what I'm doing and that what I'm doing is worthy at least of respect, if not necessarily admiration. Um, but I think that is the problem. But there's also the problem that, well, you know, you tick a couple of boxes yourself because you're black and you're mm. a parent comedian. I don't know if we're allowed to admit that. Well, yeah. 
will stay. There is this idea that the minute you are anything other than a white guy in a shirt, you are treated as being interchangeable with everybody else who is that thing. Yeah. And so one of the reasons I started the Distraction Club in London is to see the other musical acts. Because on the circuit, I never get to see any other musical acts because yeah. I'll never put two of them on the same show. Mm. But in much as, like, you know, they won't put two black guys on the same show. And they won't, you know, for a long time, they wouldn't put two women on the same show. Thankfully, mm -hmm. that has changed. Mm -hmm. But for a long time, they wouldn't put two women on the same show. They wouldn't to put two special, because, you know, because if you put two women on, they'll do all the same jokes as each other. You know, or if you put two black guys on, they'll just do all the same jokes black as each guys, other. Yeah. You know, you put two musical eyes on, they'll just do all the same jokes. Whereas apparently the white guys in shirts had access to this infinite breadth and scope of material that was mysteriously denied to everybody else, you know? <laughs> or they could all drone on about being dragged around Ikea by the girlfriend, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I got off the bus, then I stabbed him, you know? Um, but that was the thing, is that somehow you were interchangeable, you know, you, 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 could, you were interchangeable with everybody else who did that thing you did, you know, because you couldn't put, you know, you couldn't put Earl Oaken on after Phil Nickel. You wouldn't be able to tell where one stopped and the other one started, you know. But one of the things I've loved about the Distraction Club is it proves that every time you think you've seen every conceivable way of making music funny, yeah. somebody turns up with a completely new angle on it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's actually as diverse, much as character comedy is, you know, mm -hmm. much as non-white comedy is, it's as potentially diverse as anything. But for a long time, the circuit had this idea that if you were anything other than a white guy in a shirt, that instantly put you into a box. Mm -hmm. You know, you put two gay comics on, they'll do all the same jokes as each other. You know? And I just say, you know, put, if, you, if you put two women on, they'll all just do period jokes all night. Have you ever even heard a female comic do a period joke? I don't think I've ever, I think maybe like Jenny Eclair did one on Channel 4 in about 1993. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the entire half of the circuit has been tarred with it ever since. Yeah. But that's 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 the thing that you find. But um, so, yeah, one of the great things about the Distraction Club is getting to see all the other musical acts. Yeah, cool. um, <laughs> and one, one of the things I, I, I am interested to talk to you about is obviously I, yeah. I noticed you were involved in politics. And uh, yeah. I, I, I am also... Uh, I regard myself as a political comedian, a politician, but uh, <laughs> and who knows? Maybe one day, Mitch, I might end up, oh, yes. you know, running for power, you know, running for politics. Yes. You know? <laughs> and why, why, and why political satire? What, what, why politics? Why have you focused huh. on that? Well, uh, I think you kind of can't help it if you're just sort of paying attention. Uh, and I've lived through some very, very, very weird times. I mean, you know, when I first started doing this. It was only a couple of years after Margaret Thatcher was, was in power, you know, and that obviously was a very active time for satire. It has been said that satire benefits from slightly chaotic conservative administrations. The trouble is literally nothing else does. Mm. Um, and you often get people ask that question, oh, isn't it better for you as a historical mm. comedian? Isn't it better for you whenever it's gone to crap? You've got plenty to work with, isn't it? Mm. And I once heard the great John Stewart ask that question and I associate myself with his answer is, what are you out of your mind? You know, <laughs> I've got children. You know, if, if the price of my kids growing up in, in a, a safe and happy world is me having to think a bit harder to come up with the odd zinger, then that's a price I'm very willing to pay. But um, yeah, it's, it, 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 is, it, is, it is bizarre. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess you write about what's around you. Mm -hmm. You know, you write about... So, I mean, the first, the first two comedy songs I wrote because when I started off I did do a lot of that writing funny words to other people's tunes because you know I was young and it was easy and then very very early on I realized that that's a bit of a dead end because mm -hmm. you end up with an act that you don't own you mm -hmm. end up dependent upon material that you don't have the copyright to and that mm -hmm. seriously limits you and what you're allowed to do with it so I realized quite early on I was going to have to uh, write the tunes as well and the first two comedy songs I think I wrote the first one was about climate change in mm -hmm. 1996 still with us and the second one was kind of tangentially about scottish independence mm -hmm. still with us um and it wasn't necessarily a decision to become a political comedian i just wrote about stuff which was around me, mm -hmm. which was you know around me to be seen because we all see in here much the same stuff uh and 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 which i had an angle on mm -hmm. you know which i i had a take on which hopefully people might find amusing and then not long after that I, I got brought onto the Now Show. I'd, not, I'd only been going for about five years when the Now Show snapped me up. And I was there for 17 years, wow. which in retrospect 
which in retrospect was far too long. I yeah, that's, that's, that's almost like a di- that's, that's like a dictator. 17 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I should have I should have left long before they decided they'd had enough of me. Yeah. Um, and and it sounds weirdly sour grapesy, but I'm actually not a le- not the least bit sorry that. They got rid of me when they did uh, because it has freed me up to do a lot of other things. Um, but then once you're on the Now show, then, okay, now you're writing for a satirical news, uh, a satirical comedy show. So, yeah, it's going to have to be. And, and the thing is, I think you can write political comedy without it necessarily being partly political comedy. And I think one of the things that is quite important is not to get too starry-eyed about anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, because obviously, you know, I've got my political leanings. I've got, you know, I do. I always vote and I always, you know, uh, uh, I don't always necessarily vote for the same party. It's it's situational. It depends on who in, in where I happen to be, I think has the best chance of achieving the result that I want. Um, so I've got takes, I've got angles. Um, there's things that I'm, I would say there are probably things that I'm more, <laughs> things that I'm probably more firmly against than there are things I'm firmly for. But I think it's important to be, at least potentially even-handed. Um, that's not to say that you do this dreadful false equivalence thing where you criticize both sides equally. No, sometimes one side is far more worthy of criticism than the other. But what you should be ready to do is criticize you know, your own side mm. as and when they screw up. Mm. Um, it's important not to get too starry-eyed about it. You know, because, you know, for example, uh, you know, when I was signed on to the Now Show, it was in the absolute salad days of the first Tony Blair administration, when everybody was in very, very pleased with him. Uh, Bill Clinton was still in the White House, so there wasn't that slightly icky relationship with George W. Bush. And of course, the Iraq War was still four years in the future. So mm-hmm. it was very much in the sort of the salad days of everybody living contentedly under the Tony, the first Tony Blair administration. But mm-hmm. you've still got to find stuff to crack on about. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and and you've still got to you've still got to find stuff to criticize, um, mm-hmm. if indeed the stuff is there to be criticized. You've got to be ready to criticize it. So I, I'm in much much as I am in life, I'm political, but I'm not partly political. I don't have any party affiliations. I've never been a, a member of a political party. Um, so I, th- I think you know it's 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 important. Like I said, when I say even-handed, that's come to mean false equivalence, and that's incredibly damaging. This desire in the media to try and equate both sides. Well, there was blame on both sides. No, there wasn't. Sometimes one side's right, the other side's mm. plain wrong. And to pretend otherwise is not objective. You know, that's not object. Objectivity is not saying that all sides are equal. Objectivity is saying what's right's right and what's wrong's wrong. That's mm. objectivity. Mm. I think for me, anyway. it's, been, it's been really interesting how identity politics has played a significant part in British society and how comedians separate themselves either they're on the left or at the right mm-hmm. and as you rightly pointed yeah. out some people focus on attacking the conservative government because you know they've been powerful who knows yeah. how long at the moment but yeah. i have to say that i i almost i might be wrong about this because i i grew up in an environment where we had uh dictatorship that's why i'm dressed like this this is not a mental health problem <laughs> <laughs> this is just my <laughs> this is just my idea of leadership and Does that mean I'm supposed to dress up yeah, like yeah, Fletcher? Because that's yeah, what happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I do believe that at times, because I, I feel that the current opposition party is very, very weak, some comedians are coming across as, as opposition leaders, effective opposition leaders, compared to the opposition party. And, and you wonder whether that's comedy. I don't know. I, it's just, when I just... I think that's just my... But there seems to on, be... On the one hand, one could... Yeah. Yeah, go on. Well, so on the one hand, one could argue that it's easier because all we've got to do is criticise. We are not required to propose anything mm. in place of the stuff mm. we criticise. Mm. Whereas, you know, an opposition politician should be, if possible, proposing an alternative mm. rather than just criticising the status quo. Um, but, you know, I've been getting equal amounts of crap from both sides because my big hobby horse for the past four years has been Brexit. I've been yeah. very, very vocal in my opposition to Brexit. Uh, I That's how I got the column in the New European newspaper. Mm. For mm. a couple of years there, I was actually presenting and leading the sort of the anti-Brexit rallies. You mm. know, I think it is an extraordinary act of national self-mutilation. Mm. I think it was done 
for the worst possible reasons and will be having the worst possible effects. Um, if we could make the world better with four words, it would be stop pandering to racists. Um, yeah. Yeah. People get whipped up into a, 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 a xenophobic lava and rather than being told to calm the hell down because they're panicking about nothing people go oh we must address their concerns no you don't address concerns and they're imaginary if you address imaginary concerns you create problems where there were none and that is entirely what we're seeing now with brexit and now of course again well this is what remainers wanted all along mm -hmm. no it isn't this is not what we, we never wanted this we wanted to avoid this and that's why we were saying let's not do it but that's been my big hobby horse but my other my other thing um if anything yeah, I get a fair bit of crap online from Brexiters and still do. That's nothing compared to what I get from the Corbyntologists. <laughs> the, Corbyn, the Corbyntologists go way more personal. Because yeah. on the one hand, they, they were always insisting, no, this is not a cult. Don't stop calling it a cult. It's not a cult. Okay, well, if it's not a cult, why do you react exactly like the Scientologists do when anybody criticizes you? <laughs> you know, I've had Brexiters sort of, I've had Brexiters criticize my ideas and my methods and my principles. I've never had a Brexiter call me a child molester. And that's mm -hmm. what the Corbyntologists do. Wow. If you have anything other than unalloyed praise for the sainted Jeremy, you know, and I could tell that was a doomed enterprise you know, because I'm old enough to remember the last time they did it. Mm -hmm. He was called Michael Foote. OK, yeah. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn has happened before. He was called Michael Foote and it was exactly the same deal. You have the party being led by this sort of apparently benevolent but slightly doddering white-haired intellectual and meanwhile at a grassroots level it's being taken over essentially by cudgel wielding thugs who are just purging everybody they can they, they find to be of insufficient intellect in ideological purity and the big, big mistake they made was they lost an election in 2017 and, and called it a victory yeah, yeah they lost in 2017 though they did better than they were expected to do but they still lost and rather than saying where did we go wrong, wrong. yeah they, they refused to even countenance the possibility that they might have gone wrong. They decided that 2017 was a victory and all they had to do was more of the same and that their eventual actual victory was inevitable. They didn't even consider the possibility that 2017 might have been a blip. Um, and I'm not, well, not to say that it was a certainty that it was a blip, but they should have at least countenanced the possibility that it was a blip. And meanwhile, of course, now what happens now is every time I say something about Boris Johnson or every time I say anything about Brexit, I get a pile on from the left going, oh, I bet you're sorry you've sold all about Jeremy Corbyn now, aren't you? Uh, uh, I bet you're sorry you said all those things about Jeremy Corbyn now. Don't come kind to us about the Tories when you said all that stuff about Jeremy Corbyn. And I'm like, what do you mean Jeremy Corbyn who gave Boris the election? Mm. Because mm -hmm. Boris, if you remember, at the end of 2019, was dead in the water without a majority and unable to do anything. And the mm -hmm. only reason he can do what he likes now is because somebody agreed to give him a general election. Somebody who was vain and stupid enough to believe you can win a general election when you are polling at 16 percent agreed yeah. to get, you know. But, you know, you can't say that. You can't say that. So, well, yeah, it, 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 I don't know whether that means that I'm even-handed. I don't know whether that means that I am reasonable. All I do know is that I get equal amounts of crap from the left and the right. But if anything, the stuff I get from the left is nasty. Yeah, it's nasty. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's more personal. The I, get, I, I, the, I genuinely think the democracy has failed. This is just my view. I think it's, it's a virus and uh, you, you need to find a way of flattening the curve. Because for me, uh, I, I've lived in this country now, like I said, when I came on the stage, this is on a serious note. Every single time you have a change in government, they always say they want to fix the NHS, they want to fix education. None of them mm -hmm. can fix anything. They just It's just no, a no. vicious circle. So yeah. people need to ask, why is this system failing? For, for, I, I, I was going to ask you this question, because if there yeah. is a general election in a couple of years' time, if Labour doesn't change its tact, the Tories are going to get in. Uh, uh, but there's only one way out of that, and it's something I've written about in the newspaper, which is that um, Labour needs to be do it, making uh, electoral pacts with all the other progressive parties right now. Because the trouble with first past the post is that it is possible. In fact, it generally happens that you end up that the party in power generally only got the active vote of about 30% of the population. Because mm -hmm. generally speaking, the winning side gets between 40 and 45 percent and we usually get something around a two-thirds turnout mm -hmm. that's you that's the, there's there's variation some years the turnout's bigger sometimes it's turnout smaller but it's usually something of that nature the winning team will get about 42 percent 
on about a 66% turnout, which means that at any given time, 70% of the British public are living under a government they either didn't, they either actively voted against or didn't vote for. Any given time, 70% of the public are living under a government that they didn't support. And however you slice it, that's wrong. So the thing about Labour is Labour needs to accept two things. One, it's not getting Scotland back. Scotland's gone. Because as far as the majority of progressive Scots are concerned right now, there's really no difference between one English Unionist party and another English Unionist mm -hmm. party. So they're not getting Scotland back. And if they don't get Scotland back, it's almost impossible for them to win Westminster outright. So mm -hmm. what they need to be doing is making electoral pacts with all the other progressive parties. They need to be doing deals with the Lib Dems. They need to be doing, uh, having talks with the Greens. They need to be having talks with the SNP. And they've got to come up with an actual electoral pact form, the ABC coalition, the anyone but the Conservatives coalition. Uh, and they need to fight the next election as a proper coalition. It's going to be a very, very hard pill for them to swallow, principally for the Labour movement, because it's going to involve them admitting that they can't win under the present system, and they don't like to admit that. Um, but it's going to be difficult for all of them, because they're basically going to have to you know, not compete in most of the seats that they wanted to, and they may even end up having to spend money and campaign for other people's candidates. But this is the only way that they're going to get around the Conservatives, because the Conservatives, at the end of the day, have got the whole of the right wing. They may occasionally lose bits of it to your, your, your BNPs and your UKIPs and whatever pyramid scheme Farage is flogging at the moment. <laughs> but by and large... By and large, those people will always come back to the Conservatives for the general election because that's what Conservative means. Whereas the progressive wing is completely fractured. We've got Labour, we've got the SNP, we've got the Greens, we've got the Lib Dems, and they're all taking votes away from each other. And the way you do this deal is you tell them, once we're in, it's proportional representation. Yeah. Once, once we're in, and then all these minor parties will actually start to wield some influence relative to their support. Because, you know, the Greens are generally at about 10% and they've only ever had one MP, mm. you know? Um, the Greens have about 25% of the support that the Tory party has, and they've got one MP. Um, it's, you know, and, and the thing is, the case for first past the post, I think, has been thoroughly disproven in the last decade because what they always used to say mm -hmm. about first past the post, the reason you can't get rid of first past the post is, what, do you want to be like the Italians? <laughs> what you want to have, you know, 25 political parties and fractious coalitions and parties torn apart by internal infighting and an election every two years. That is literally where we've been for the last decade. Mm -hmm. So all the things that first past the post is meant to protect us from, it hasn't. But on a more fundamental level, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say democracy is working because, you know, as Churchill famously said, it's the worst possible system of government apart from all the others. Um, if it's not functioning that well at the moment, it's because it supposes an informed populace. And what we have now is not just an uninformed populace, it's a disinformed populace. Yeah. It's, a, it's a deliberately misinformed populace. Um, and this is why, you know, the sheer irony of, on the one hand, you'll get Andrew Neil on Twitter bemoaning the fact that, you know, the Fox News of the world have completely brought America literally to the brink of civil war because of the total isolation of all the news mm -hmm. bubbles over there. And the fact that you not only do you not have to respect anybody else's opinion, you don't even have to be exposed to anybody else's opinion. You mm -hmm. can just absolutely seal yourself inside whatever little hermetically sealed uh, ideological sphere you want to be, while at the same time saying, and yeah, let's do that here too. Let's get <laughs> Gammon Ball News up and running. Let's yeah. give two hours a night to Julia Dunning Kruger. You know, let's all those people who've been cutting up their masks on talk radio, one of whom was a close friend of mine, and that really hurt. Uh, wow. sorry, I'm never going to be able to speak to him again. Um, but you know, won't name his name, but there's a very good friend of mine who's been all over the news ripping up masks on talk radio. And, uh, I know, I know, I know him. <laughs> he's a really, he's a really nice guy. We go back decades, and mm. he's a really, really nice guy. And, and I hope they're paying you well. What can I tell you? And <laughs> yeah. I hope they're paying you well. Oh, dear. Um, yeah, I hope you're sleeping easy because, you know, you're getting people killed. Sleep well. Um, but, yeah, but in the meantime, you know, and, and, and so we're going to get Gammon Ball News, you know, and, and we're going to get, you know, um, the Daniel Hanan show or some damn thing. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, you know, on the one, you know, you look at the insanity that this is creating in America. I mean, the literal insanity where you have QAnon head cases mm -hmm. actually taking seats in Congress. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, th th this, I mean, literal tinfoil-hatted insanity in the chambers of government 
um, where you have three weeks after an armed revolt whose intention was to kill them all, you have the Republicans voting against even having an impeachment trial mm -hmm. because there's just no overlap between the realities that these people are having. See, this is the problem. What you used to have is you used to have a left and a right wing proposing alternative solutions to the same problems. Right? Yeah. What you have now is a left wing that believes one whole set of problems pertain and a right wing that believes a completely different set of problems pertain. So they're not like offering alternative explanations for the same thing. Yeah. They believe that completely different things are happening. Mm. And it's almost impossible to have any kind of conversation between somebody who's actually on a different planet to you. Mm. Mm. Um, so I don't know what you do about that. I really don't. I think. Why don't you just get rid of? Why, why, why don't you just get rid of democracy and try something else? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but then who, who's who's in charge? I mean, I don't. Look, know. I don't look, know. You know, you know what's really interesting for me is when you Go look on. at when you look at America and you look at Britain. The, yeah. there's, there's a flirtation to dictatorship and coups. You hear, you hear oh, people yeah. talk about, oh yeah, he's a dictator. Oh yeah, he's thinking there's going to be a coup. These people do have no idea what it's like. Of course, the bloody <laughs> <laughs> of course the bloody I mean, it's not the whole thing about I'm being silenced. Yeah, hear exactly. How I'm being hear about how I'm being silenced on my two-hour cable show. Read my book about how I'm being silenced. Yeah. I'm being silenced, I explained to my three million Twitter followers. You know, it's, it's, it's you've got no clue yeah. what it's like. You know, what well, this one what winds me up about conspiracy theorists, you know, it, it's just like you know, on the one hand, you believe that there is this pernicious, all-powerful conspiracy that's controlling all information. You like say the flat earthers, right? Mm -hmm. For some reason, the powers that be whoever they are, have decided that it is absolutely essential that the human race never learns the big truth, which is that the Earth is flat, all right? Mm. And so to conceal this big truth, they have constructed an even bigger lie involving falsifying the whole of human history. So you've got the ancient Greeks measuring the circumference of the planet 3,000 years ago, which of course never happened. And you've got Columbus, which never happened. Now, you know, we've got an entirely fictitious country called Australia on the bottom side of it which has thus necessitated, you know, bringing in several hundred thousand crisis actors to rock up every now and again, putting on a funny voice and pretending to actually come from there. And, you know, so apparently they're capable of organizing this, this complete falsification of the whole of human history, but they can't get your YouTube video taken down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I, it's, you know, it's just... My mate, you know, my mates decided for a laugh in the early days, in the early days of lockdown to do one of those piecemeal remakes where you mm -hmm. remake a movie one scene at a time. You get assigned a scene each, and they did Toy Story, right? So this was an unofficial remake of a Disney property. It was up for twenty minutes mm -hmm. before Disney had it taken down. You know, mm -hmm. it's not hard for somebody with sufficient oomph to get your YouTube video taken down, and yet here you are exposing the pernicious conspiracy <laughs> which has ruled the world for six thousand mm -hmm. years, and your YouTube. Your video is just up there yeah. because the, anyway <laughs> yeah, but, yeah and, and when people complain about oh you've taken my freedom of rights you're not giving me the opportunity to protest i mean i've mm. said to people a lockdown you can still go out and go and get what you want essentials you know nobody's monitoring you or tracking you but anyway um it, it, you, know, <laughs> you, you know you seem to be very interested i love it the fact that you're really interested in in, in politics um why haven't you run for office? Why? Why? Oh my why God! Are not, why are you not an MP? <laughs> oh my God! Um, I don't know if I could function within a party system. That's my thing. You know, like I say, I'm political, but I'm not party political. I have voted for various different political parties at various yeah. times in my life, depending on what my constituency was, how what the, the land was, who was most likely to, if not necessarily anybody enthusiastically endorsed, who was the most likely to beat the person I really didn't want to win. Yeah. You know, um, I'm not sure I could function that well within, because if you actually... If you actually sign up and take a party whip and become, you know, a party, because then, you know, also... Also, I just don't like the idea of exposing my friends and family to the kind of crap that that would expose them to. Because at the moment, it's just me that gets the crap, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and it's just a bunch of arseholes on Twitter. It's not the sun. It's not the Daily Express Ooh. going after me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, and, and, and if I became that kind of politically active, then it would. And it wouldn't just be me they went after. You know, they'd be going through my family history. They'd be, you know, 
going out to watch that. You know, my kids will get dragged into it. So there's there's all that. So it's not like, oh, no, I feel I can do more. for no. I am very aware of how limited my influence is. <laughs> I, am very, I am very aware of the fact that I bring literally no influence to bear on proceedings. And yeah, maybe there are ways in which I could. But also it's, um, you know, you know, it's, it's, one wonders i mean i okay there have been instances in other countries of comedians getting into politics and then actually on at least one instance and they're actually becoming the president after he played the president in a sitcom when was yeah, that you, ukraine, ukraine, was ukraine 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 that's right he's yes. ukraine yeah the ukrainian president is a guy who used to play it, it basically it's like paul eddington becoming prime minister at the end of the 80s isn't it mm. um having played him on tv so you I, know I i'm you, aware I, of the fact you know i'll tell you what i did when he became president i wrote to him yeah and i said <laughs> oh can you remember when we were gigging in the united kingdom now you don't want to respond to oh. me no, it was a joke. Was he over? It was a joke. It was a All joke. right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tried it again. And then yeah. one of his officers said, he's very busy at the moment. He will get back to you as if you believe. <laughs> but, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I see, I see. It's only, it's only after the, the lockdown. And because I'm sure like you, I traveled all over the United Kingdom, performing everywhere mm -hmm. in basements. Oh, God, I, yes. I met <laughs> audience members who we're almost like constituents for me, you know, yeah. addressing them yeah. because we're almost like politicians because you're going around talking to them, making them happy if you can. And, you yeah. know, they, they forget about politics if you're not doing political comedy. But I think, I think, I think that, I think you make a good MP. I think you make, as an independent candidate, <laughs> independent candidate. Conceivably. And, and you have, you have well over 71 followers, all right? 71,000 followers. 71,000, yes. Yeah, 71, I've got 71,000 followers. Yeah, I know, but I mean, as I know from you know my experience of trying to you know sell books to them and get them to turn up to touring shows, there's a big difference between somebody following you on Twitter and you know actually spending money on you or leaving the house to come see you. You know, mm -hmm. so it's um, yeah, it, one shouldn't read too much into that. Um, I don't know, but I think also it's uh, it's funny as you said because I mean I don't know I, I mean. I keep reading on like the Facebooks of the world. So many of my comedy pals going, "Oh my God, I miss gigging." I miss gigging. I need to be out there among the public and I need to see. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't miss that at all. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm going to do it again as and when it becomes a thing because it's kind of what I do. But I think I'm going to start being a bit a bit pickier about what I, I mean. I'll still tour, I'll still tour under my own right, and yeah. I'll still do Edinburgh because I'm actually, I think, pretty good at doing Edinburgh. Mm. I've, no, I haven't cracked at doing Edinburgh. There's no secret, but I think I've, I'm pretty good at doing it the way I do it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I'm going to be driving seven, 800 miles a week anymore. I think, mm. you know, well, in the words of Danny Glove, I'm getting a bit old for this shit, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be going back to all that anymore. But it is interesting that you're right. It does afford you a bit of an insight because for example, I was not surprised in 2016 when the referendum went leave. I yeah. was not surprised. I was sad. I was disappointed, but I was not, it wasn't for me the jaw dropping shock that I keep reading that it was because, you know, I drive around the country trying to, and one of the, one thing you could say is, you know, people, there are certain circumstances under which people are more honest and unguarded than others. And you probably learn more about somebody by finding out what does or doesn't make them laugh yeah. than pretty much anything else. So it always makes me laugh when I keep being told that, you know, oh, what do you know there in your metropolitan bubble? You know, I say, well, I'll tell you what I know. I know what makes people from literally Newquay to Inverness mm -hmm. laugh um, because I've had to try and make all of them laugh at some mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen, you know, the way attitudes shift. I've seen the way priorities shift. I've seen, you know, how some places are just more engaged than others. Some places are more insular than others. Some places are more parochial than others. Some places. So for me, I actually wasn't that surprised. when I, mm. I was surprised about Trump. That came right out of the blue, but then that was a statistical impossibility. But, right but, but I, I, um, I'm not surprised about Trump because I also genuinely believe that as much as people are saying, oh, Trump has left now and, uh, you know, wasn't part of the establishment and, the establishment got it absolutely wrong as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and, they, did. and, and they, they think that because Trump was, because it could happen in this country as well. If the establishment mm -hmm. don't get their act together, someone else will rise and, and, and just focus on the poor. And, you know, look, look, how could you, you have someone like Nigel Farage? Thank God he's not in the House of Commons. I mean, 
Mm -hmm. Nigel Farage. I mean, Nigel Farage well, changed this country. He did. Well, Nigel Farage achieved something that the Nazis never achieved. He achieved something the IRA never achieved. He achieved something Al Qaeda never achieved. He turned the British people against each other. Yeah. And for this, I don't think he can ever be forgiven. Um, but you're right. I mean, but the, the, the only thing I find surprising about Farage is how utterly transparent he is. I don't know how anybody fails to see through him. That's a thing, because that man is an entirely self-serving demagogue. And if he thought he could be making more money and getting more attention by being the world's biggest liberal, he would be the world's most internationalist liberal. He's doing what he's doing because it makes him money and gets him attention. And that's the same with so many of them. That's the same with, you know, the failed game show contestant who will not be named. She got famous by being a horrible person. And the more horrible she was, the more famous she got. <laughs> so right now she's trapped in this circle of just hideousness and attention. Yeah, and, and if we all deprive her of attention, then she might become a better person. But we're not going to do that because she's a train wreck and people stare at train wrecks. Mm -hmm. um, this, you know, if you like, is, is one of the, the sort of the malaises that has set in, if you like, in Western societies is, is the quest for attention at all costs. That everything has to, everything has to be about clicks and likes mm -hmm. and this kind of weird social currency that we've built up right now. And the trouble is people have realized that you can actually get more of that by being horrible than by being nice. Um, you can get more attention by you can get more attention you can get more attention by shouting and screaming about foreigners than you can by pointing out that Britain is held together by immigration. Mm. You know, Britain is I mean, this is the, the thing which occurred to me the last time I was in Austria. And bear with me, because this starts off sounding like it's going to... This starts off sounding like they come over here, ran. Mm. But I, you know, had to go in hospital overnight for reasons a few months ago. And apart from the nice old lady on the desk, everybody I saw in my entire hospital stay there was either somebody with a foreign surname or somebody who painfully spoke English as a second language. So everybody there was probably either a first, second or third generation immigrant. And it occurred to me, immigrants are not cashing in on the NHS. Immigrants are not exploiting the NHS. Immigrants are not overwhelming the NHS. Immigrants are the fucking NHS. Yes. All right? know, and and, and this, I, this idea that we've, we've allowed people to propagate that what you've got are all these poor, overworked British doctors and nurses being run ragged by the demands of a bunch of swarthy interlopers is not just untrue, it's the reverse of the truth. What we have is poor, overworked foreign doctors and nurses being run ragged by the demands of white British people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I That's have, what the NHS is. Mitch, I have a friend with Joe yeah. that right. Well, I say the NHS should be renamed the Nigerian Health Service. The Nigerian <laughs> Because it's well, just full of, yeah, it's because it's full of immigrants. No, this is this, this idea, you know, you know. Go on. No, no, no. That's no, but that, that, that just occurred to me. I mean, it's something I've probably always known on a kind of a cellular level, but there it was yeah. actually because you know I'm, I'm more aware of that whole argument about you know and you know, and, and of course that, that was how they swung Brexit was sticking the big lie on the bus about the NHS because who doesn't want to fund the NHS you know yeah, but it's yeah. like you know but anyway anyway but yeah it is not just untrue it's the reverse of the truth yeah. Look, it's been fantastic. Uh, Thank you so much. To you and I, I, I feel very honoured to to. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I am glad that my my people chose wisely uh, because I wanted to be intellectually stimulated in terms of British politics. But you never know, Mitch. I might end up running for office one day. But maybe oh, just take it, it over. Mate. Do it. You know, I, might, I might. Yes, absolutely. Might. Um, just for my listeners and viewers, just Go in case on. they want to catch you anywhere you know maybe just listen to you online or watch your videos what are, what are your social media um handles i am the easiest guy in the world to find online because my name is mitch ben m-i-t-c-h b-e two n's if you google that it all comes up my youtube channel is mitch ben patreon all in one go uh on twitter i am mitch ben on facebook i am mitch ben 
Uh, on Spotify, I am Mitch Ben. Uh, on uh, on Bandcamp, I am Mitch Ben. And I have books out under the name Mitch Ben. If you go to Amazon and search the name Mitch Ben, my sci-fi trilogy is up there and part three comes out on March 15th. So, yeah, I, I, I am the easiest guy in the world to find in electronic terms. I do like to be approachable, although it does mean you sometimes get approached. Okay. I have one of my six wives, because I have six wives. Uh, I don't know if you know, Mitch, uh, but you don't have to give me a response now. I have a lot to well, I have modeled uh, my I have modeled my face, body, and personality <laughs> on Henry VIII, so I can't really complain about that. <laughs> I have, we have a national anthem. It's a lot of oh, yes. national anthem. And she said I should make a request to see whether you will consider one day playing that national anthem and me singing it with you playing it in a guitar one of these days. We'll have to do it. Send me an MP3 and I will get it together. Excellent. Fantastic. Look, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I wish you well. I wish you continued success uh, and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you, Your Excellency. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is that it? We good? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. You enjoyed that? Very much. That was great fun. That was great yeah, fun. About when's that going to go live? Yeah. Sorry? About when is that going to go live? It yeah. might even go live this evening. It might go Ooh, live this okay. evening. Yeah. So I let you know. I um, Please I've do. Got a, I've got a gig uh, with um, Out of Bounds Comedy Club. Do you know them? No. Richard, Richard Minnis. No, no, no. Yeah, give, give, yeah, give, Give, give my regards. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I don't yeah. think I know them. Yeah, yeah, so I know out of the box. That's Matt Brown, but I don't know out of bounds. Yeah, oh, out out of box. Yeah. I can't seem to get in there. He seems to like a lot of high profile comics. <laughs> I think the reason I occasionally think the reason I occasionally get in out of the box is because it's in Kingston, which is almost where I live. So yeah. um, you know, it's literally about a mile up the road from my I, house. I did so it. I, think that's... I did it in, on the 16th of March last year. I was a replacement act with Tim Vine. Tim Vine was, oh, all, wow. uh, it was fantastic. It was really, really fantastic. I, 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 do miss, I, I, hear, I hear what you say about uh, not wanting to travel, but I miss that. I miss that yeah. buzz of you know, yeah. the audience. I miss that buzz. But yeah, look, me too. Me too. I, I will let you know. Thank you so much. And you have a lovely Thank day. Thank you, buddy. Thank you very much. Speak to you, man. Thank you. Bye bye.